Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Coach here, Fun Day. Taking it for you on for yours. Um, I did the video on here about last week, you know what I'm saying, about the pygmies being here in America. Um, African pygmies, whatnot, you know, and um, I did a part one of that, part two coming at real soon. I just want to throw some more base on the plate about the pygmies, you know what I'm saying, because you got a lot of these cats come out, well, we're Aboriginal Indians and all that black, but you know, I'm not knocking, I'm not saying it's not true. But you also got to give respect, homage and respect to this African pygmy element that was over here. You know what I'm saying? All the pygmy people that was over here. You know, I say African, but you know, pygmy people that was over here. And this right here we're looking at, you know, I'm going to break it up in parts. Linking ancient pygmy cosmology to the enduring myths and symbols and rituals of Africa, Australia, and the Americas. Because, you know, as you know, you know what about the pygmies, they were the one passing out the knowledge. As you see right here, we got a pygmy holding a snake, you know, hair braided, you know, you see the beautiful features, the beautiful African features there, you know. And here's the abstract. Ancient pygmy myths and codes contain important truths, but we cannot experience those truths to us if they are just stories of more than just endangered first people who still exist. They need to be felt as real. This calls for a view of pygmy descendants as skin stewards of healing wisdom. African pygmy ancestors prefigured environmental activism in their code, and their direct descendants as identified by DNA are actually the surviving root of humanity's racial, religious, and linguistic origins. To be acknowledged and treated with respect for their great contributions, this paper examines the influence of the millennium-old pygmy cosmology and moral directives, foundation of the cosmic serpent myths, and rituals found among the indigenous cultures spanning the world. <clears throat> These myths and rituals also emphasize the significance of a parallel underground world from which animals and humans emerge after the deluge, which is the flood of Noah. You know, go figure, go what? The pygmy culture inheritance is also the basis for multiple Egyptian myths, which in turn influence many biblical stories accepted in the West. She does her acknowledgments, which she should, you know, because she this is a hell of a paper. The serpent creator of the ancient pygmy ancestors. If we travel in the Mount Hills of Bosito Hills in northwestern Botswana, the only uplifted area for miles around, we see a stone python, six feet high and 20 feet long, emerging from a cave of the side of a holy mountain. It is known as the modern sand pygmies as the rock that whispers, and still revered by them in an unbroken continuum for 70,000 years. Ancestors of the Botswana Swan people apparently ground away at the natural outcrop of its heightened similarity to a python head and body, said Dr. Sheila Coulson, a visiting authority on Stone Age tools from Oslo University. We can look early to sand mythology for the first creation myth, orally transmitted from generation to generation in faithful detail. The myth has, that had mankind descended from a python and that the ancient and arid stream beds that are around the hills have said have been created by the python and in ceaseless search for water. The sand believed the python represent Cain, the great master, and the lord of all life. So according to the very ancient sand creation legend, people didn't always live on the surface on the earth. At one time, people and animals live underneath the earth with Cain, the cosmic serpent. In this place of light without sun, people and animals live together peacefully, understanding each other. Here in this underground Eden, Cain began to plan the wonders he would exhibit in the world above. First, Cain manifested a wonderful tree with branches stretching over the entire country. At his base, he dug a hole that reached all the way down into the realm where people and animals live. After he had finished the world as he pleased, he led the first man and woman up from the hole. Soon, all of you were gathered at the foot of the tree, all by the world they had just had entered. Next, Cain had the animal race out of the world beneath until all were out. Here's a picture of it. You know, they're doing the little things about it, you know.
about the mythology. It's kind of weird too that you know how I start with a serpent, you know, and then how you read the um, the stuff the stuff that I was us from the other Bibles, stuff like the Bibles and things that the serpent was an evil creature and had a knowledge of good and evil and all that other stuff like that. You know, it just makes you wonder. Cain instructed the people and the animals to live peacefully together. Then he warned men and women not to build any fires or a great evil will befall them. They gave their word and Cain left where he could watch his world in secret. As evening approached, the sun disappeared and fear entered the hearts of people. They could no longer see each other as they lacked the eyes of the animals that was capable of seeing in the dark. They lacked the warmth of fur of animals also and soon grow cold. In desperation, one man suggested they build a fire to keep warm. Beginning Cain's warning, they disobeyed him. They soon grew warm and once again were able to see each other. However, the fire frightened the animals. They fled to the caves and mountains, and ever since people broke Cain's commandment, have not been able to communicate with the animal. Fear has replaced friendship once beheld by these two groups. If we examine the salmon from a Nigerian Obo perspective, we can agree with the independent scholar, New Minister saying that there are similarities between the belief of the sand people and of the Obos of Nigerian as revealed through linguistics. One of the names of the god of the Obos is Chen in Ti. Ti refers to spirit, the universal energy of God, while N has suppressed A and will make N A meaning N. E, E K E, and oval has a double meaning of creation, python. So, fully translated, Tinkani means the God spirit that creates through the python. Ness points out that also similar in the sand's journey to the upper world and the evil world of the visible. Uwalawa, Uwa means top, while Lua is the world. So, we live above top the world that is underground, the Egyptian underworld. The duet. It becomes clear that the ancient Obos view this upper world we live in as a temporary passage, while the Uwa, the world underground, is the home to which one returns. Ubu linguistics divine Cain, the one of his tree, by name, Osari. Osari means coming from, while Ezra's mean head. While trees occupy the primary position in the world, on the pain of the surface of the earth before humans, they must be treated with the utmost respect. Right there you see a sand hunter in the Kauai Desert. And who are these myth makers and venerators of the stone serpent, the python? The anatomical, linguistic, and genetic decisiveness, distinctiveness, excuse me, of the Southern African pygmy group suggests that they are the world's first and oldest people, confirmed by oral traditions. About 140,000 years ago, human populations from East and Central Africa migrated south to colonize Southwestern Africa. They were met by the Aboriginal Twa people, descended of those who lived in the region long before the arrival of taller black or white people. Twa means just or only in the sense that you say it's just a win or it's only me. The Twa First people status is based on the retained genetic DNA markers of the most ancient Homo sapiens. Evidence gathered from mitochondria, hypo, or specific DNA sequence analysts to be one of the oldest races on Earth. Forest paid me links the Egyptian and West African Opal legends. Origin legends. Creation myths seem to adjust the specific locales and, percep and perceptions of their author. E.P. Pygmies of the Turner Rainforest, cousins to the sands, trace their planet origins back to the holy mount of Baba Tibi, one of eight giant volcano cones soaring above the hundreds of smaller cones and collectively known as the Mountains of the Moon in Uganda. As the center of the earth for the ethane, they sit directly on the equator up or over the historical source of the north flowing now rising from what is the heart of the equator forest stretches from the east coast to the west coast of Africa. Egyptians too place their homeland at the source of the southern of the southern Nile. Same thing if you read the papyrus of Nefer, 
It says the same that we come from the Koi lands, the lands of the mountains of the moon. That's the place of the Uganda. So they, so the Egyptians say they come from the same thing too, paying homages to the pygmies. Now remember, when I drop sorry when I drop the stuff about pygmies being all over the world, this is where the pygmies say they come from, from the mountains of the moon in Uganda. I mean, go we got seventy years ago, seventy thousand years, and now let's go back on that. Ancestor pygmy legend has it that after the deluge, humanity was swallowed up by a monster snake associated with the water. The first man, I think, arrived on the surface of the earth in the underworld by cutting a path through his mother's toe. The great mother, Matu, in the form of the mountain of the moon. His hand, he carried three divine iron wire spears, which he came equipped to handle. In later universal myth, the three spears morphed into a trident. If they pursued giant serpent through the dense forest, killing the monster with a spear thrust through his open mouth. As they then ripped open the snake belly with a spear blade, and all the pygmies, now resurrected, crawled out through the citadel slit and marched back into the forest. Pygmy belief in reincarnation of spirit rests also on the snake's yearly shedding of his skin, releasing a new serpent. When pygmies die now, it is thought that the spirit enters the python which visits the camp for a short time, then goes away. The pygmy code given by Efe to the pygmy guys, their wise approach towards nation, nature, prefiguring environmental activism and their behavior, and demonstrating the same casual and ethnic thinking that exemplify that types that are their views on human behavior in society. These are echoed in the 42 negative commandments of ancient Egyptians, in the 42 negative confessions of Mayat, the negative commandments, and the negative commandments of the Igbo and the Hebrews Ten Commandments. So this is the precursor to all that. This is the precursor to the 42 laws of Mayad, the negative confessions, um, the Hebrew negative commandments, which is which the same thing as the Egyptian, and the Hebrew Ten Commandments, which we already know is more of a cut. So the pygmy code. If we to help stand the tide of the current destruction collective behavior, we need to raise our conscience and return to this live of vice. The pygmy code. One, one time unnecessary killing of animals is forbidden. Two, wasteful destruction of trees and plants is regarded as a crime. Three, wasting food is a great sin. Four, trapping is forbidden. Five, following streams and rivers with refuse or excrement is a sin. Six, Cruelty to children and old people is a major sin. Seven, murder is a sin. Eight, disrespect parent, disrespect towards parents or elders is a sin. Nine, failure to help a wounded or stray pygmy from another territory is a sin. Ten, sorcery is a sin. 11. Adultery is a sin. 12. Coward behavior during the hunt is a sin. 13. Wife beating is a sin. 14. Husband beating is a sin. 15. Blasphemy is a sin. 16. Slander is a sin. 17. Theft is a sin. 18. Eating fertilized eggs to see a life is a sin. Let us now turn to the ancient Egyptians' adoption of the Casa Snake in the Underworld myth and the profound connections of the pygmies as the first answers of the pre- and early dynastic Egyptians. We meet Tim, the first Egyptian version of the cosmic snake serpent on the pyramid walls as the beloved sun god pushes aside when Ra comes to the stage. The serpent was not worshipped, but represented an attribute. 
As a result of the constant tension between Tim and Ron, Tim was morphed into an evil Aldapris, the serpent who does not want Ron to succeed in his task of bringing the dawn of each day. Egyptians believe the sun god Ra is reborn to the new day, only after been drawn into the serpent body of Aldapris and the Duat. Tim and Aldapris carry 12 gates of the zodiac, through which, likewise, the human soul has to pass before returning to the purified source of the source. There you go. This shows them right here with the 12 loops. Representing the 12 zodiacs. You know, that set spearing Adolphus with the trident. We talked about the trident earlier. You know, so we're going to go a little bit more deep into this. The pyramids were pregnant in Egypt since pre dynastic times. Documented by the discovery of the Sam Bushman skeleton dated between 14,000 and 12,000 BC, found in the Nile Valley. Ancient deities such as the Pygmy Bess, originally healing for Nubia, was revered as the oldest of all Egyptian deities and a protector of household, mother, and children. Statues of nature and breasts appear to be modeled on the features of a Nubian dwarves retained as entertainers. Ancient Egyptians had no words or symbols to differentiate the war from a pygmy. So it is to best the pygmy of Khufu, to which the Egyptians attribute their ancestry rather than the wars. Khufu, the land of the spirits and the gods, was first envisioned as heaven and next seen the part of the underworld and the moon, and finally manifested on earth at the head of the Nile from which the first people strang and their souls will return. Perhaps surprisingly, another pygmy attribute to examine is the technological skill. Or tradition among the pygmy tribe of the Congo rainforest, though, emphasized that in ancient times, pygmy ancestors became so technology advanced that they almost destroyed the entire forest. Pygmies realized they needed this forest to survive, so decided the highest form of technology, the highest form of wisdom, will be to learn how to live in harmony with nature. And so, they live voluntarily what modern people see as a primitive life in a forest. Every pygmy elders say, our society will die if the forest dies. The forest is our great house. We live in a great house and sleep in our little huts. The trees are the great house of God. The tall trees will longer to God. If he told us that the trees must never be cut. Here, right here in this figure, you know, that I'm about to highlight, is a pygmy cliff dwellings. And it's, you know what I'm saying? Um, they found something like this. If you go back to read the first, the list of the first video about the ancient pygmies in Tennessee, they found a, a, a ancient pygmy city just like this in Tennessee, in the mountains, in the Cumberland Mountains, you know? So, some similar. African pygmies had the ability to craft and create any tool or technology they needed for their survival and well-being. Examples of former pygmy technology can be found in the Dogon of Mali tribal legends of rare-skinned pygmies they call Toiloi. As one of the first to live and settle in the Bagana environment of northern Mali, boring the Magrav during the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE. These pygmies appear to have spread their influence from the Central African Rainforest Belt as far as of once burdened North African Sahara Plains or vice versa. It is believed by the Dogon people that the Toiloi must have been aero pygmies, gifted with the ability to fly, so as to reach their dwellings of granaries 2,000 feet up on the sheer sides of the cliff. Rock pains in Sahara I interpret as flying pygmies seem to support the legend. It is all the more possible if we take their earlier sophisticated technical abilities into consideration. Later, during 14 and 15 BC, pygmies called Tellum also built homes and granary in their skirment, and the remains would still can be seen. Ancient pygmy technological expertise extended from iron smelting and forgering. Legia in the Ongun state in Nigeria consists of prehistoric iron smelting up to industrial proportions in the form of ancient furnaces and far from the use of coal and iron slag heaps. 
According to Oval Tradition, Catherine Ong, the meaning of Lee or Elijah is where Eli hid himself. Eli is equated to Atum, the sun god, as a serpent in the pre wild Egyptian tradition. So Lili is the sanctum of the hidden god Atum. The iron smelted in Lili is divine iron, similar to the Lord of the divine metal staff of Eri. And the iron forged in three separate ipping carried when born from his mother's toe. In Eden, the summer on the Niger, which is a book, I want to promise the question, where did all the smelting iron go? She deposits a huge strip of smelting iron alloys with a huge figure struck over Ashur, the underground halls and palaces known by ancient Egyptians, known as the Halls of Amenta, and the Duat. Images from the Egyptian pyramid text show that the Duat was a huge tunnel-like construction with several floors leading to various sections and inhabited by animal-headed deities and snake beings Parallel dimensional bridging ancestor Smith of the Leon could have played a strong role in this construction. Abuato Dundun Arke Shrine in a village in the center of the Arke village, Leah's location is a 80 foot crescent shaped pile of slag. This crescent moon and sun disk are reminders of faraway moon mountains. We talked about earlier the Baba Tate or the mountain of the mountain and the moon, back to the path of Tiranapa. Remember, African people, you know, we've been knocked off the knowledge for so hard, you know what I'm saying? But that's where all African people come from, the mountains and the moon, you know, in Uganda. That's, that's the Garden of Eden, where all the rivers touch and the Nile and all that stuff. Back to this. A door well in a tunnel realm at its base. At the crescent's inner, Midpoint, the sun disk and slags hide the hole said to be the portal of the world, underworld. Anu, the mouth of the earth, which opens the amena, the land of the living dead. A heaven not located in the sky, but under the earth. Akin to the pygmy pit at the base of Baba Tali and Amina, the Egyptian do what? Once a year, the Oki okay priests feed the living dead occupants of Amina with boiled yams and palm oil during an annual festival of Duranashi, communication of the dead with the living. Nuba Bense Anani notes that the Oboe word for worship is Efe. My Efe equates to LA blessed in this observation. Linguistic research by Catherine Alon reveals that Yushi means the Romano living dead ancestor and they're related to Nushi, the evil word for dwarves but more than likely for the ancient pygmies called Twa, the cultural and linguistic progenitor of the Ibu people. The Yushi were the immortals who never died, because in their time, death had not yet come. Well, there's a battery-operated model, there's a time battery model, excuse me, of the Egyptian Ben Ben and Leon, known as Onago Wu, a conical mud Ephesus, similar to the term I heal and form with flag motors piled around in its gradual step pyramid style base. On a mythic level, the ancient edifice also represents Baba Tali, cone at the center of the earth. Anadiz Wu, associated with the fertile and prefiguration, marking, matching two traits of the Pimi god best. Odo Kid Unavenged, the house of fire in the Oko village, is structure located in the immediate right of the Oshu shrine. Its conical shape of its teeny doors had and no windows, and a traditional shape of a Ubu furnace. The narrow conical house with a conical roof, one door, and no window is frequently seen in the images of the underworld, the Duat, and is often referred to as the House of Fire. No coincidence. As a shrine house for the ancestral iron smelt of the Leon, it is where the village masquerades or the spirit of their ancestors issue forth a joint annual ceremony for the dead. Masquerades are a key component of Ubu culture that survive Western influences. It is generally believed that the masquerade is a spirit which springs forth from the underworld. As shown right here, the House of Fire, the Ubu shine in the Oka village and the opening of mouth ceremony with fire. You know, 
a lot of people, I remember when people, this is a sidebar real quick, I remember when people used to talk stuff like, well, y'all supposed to be West African, you know, for people over here in the United States, you know, y'all supposed to be West African, why are you talking about the Egyptians? It's all the same cultures, all the same, I'm just connecting the dots, it's all the same language, culture, everything. We are the Egyptians from that past. You know what I'm saying? And I bought a couple more videos on there to prove that. The sun is already on my page. Also, look up to the southern route between um, Lake Chad, because Lake Chad was the midpoint point between West Africa and Egypt. It was a route that goes through there. You know. The spiritual development of ancient Egyptian and the Bolos ultimately traces back to the guidance of the pygmy, morals formed for thousands of years of clearly observation, cause, and effect. Protocol was a language of the indigenous pygmy at the Niger Benja confluence, a concept put forth by Anna Lum. Through her dating is though her dating is questionable. It was the first of the language of symbols before developed into words and transferred later into settlers. The Amo and the Nirkin, Amagana, the Yorba, Edo, Anama, and the Jawa tribes in southern Nigeria and the Ashanti and the Khan tribes in Ghana, I will observe, the separation of Obo language from the rest of the KY languages took place around 6000 BC. The Igbo subculture itself well defined by this period. What we see the Igbo culture was molded by the race of families called Netanyahu, son of the dwarves, who are still functioning as civilizers or historians and priests and shaping sustaining the religion in the ethical world of the evil. All right, we're gonna stop right there. You know what I'm saying? That just showed the African half. You know, we're gonna show it all the way around the world. You know what I'm saying? So it's not mistakenly that you can't say that, you know, well, African people were went over here and no stuff like that. Well we got African pygmies in Tennessee. And I'm showing you the same that they're doing. And in part two, I'm going to show them in Australia. You know what I'm saying? So we can kill all the little BS on off. We're going to show what they was doing there. You know, much love. Hope things, you know, thanks for listening to the channel. Much love for that. You know what I'm saying? Hey, subscribe to the channel. Hey, donate to the movement, man, because we up here doing and studying and stuff all the time. You know, and community activities. This is what we do. You know what I'm saying? So donate to the movement. Hey, thanks and peace for listening. You know what I'm saying? A lot of love on that. Hey, and we keep on pushing African history. This is our culture. This is our planet. This is what we do. Peace.